I grew up at a time when BMW was the ultimate driving machine. From owning the streets to reigning supreme in motorsports, BMW cars were unparalleled in performance and engineering. The M in Bavarian Motor Works stood for engines, and their expertise in this area was unparalleled. They could do anything, big or small. With a small turbo four-cylinder, they broke Formula One horsepower records. And with a huge V12 proudly sitting in the McLaren F1's gold-plated engine bay, they helped set hypercar speed records that still stand today. They won at Le Mans, they won Formula One, and they just about dominated touring car championships. They truly knew how to push the limits and win. But what fascinated me most was how BMW constantly advanced their technology and applied what they learned on the track to cars on the street. Automotive magazines waxed lyrical about the M3 and M5's tight handling and sharp reflexes, but even the regular 3 and 5 series were a joy to drive. BMWs provided sports car dynamics in a practical, spacious package and were even luxurious to boot. Their sports sedans were the standard to which everyone else was compared, and their 7 series was the best of the best. With unheard of technology and luxurious features, it was like a Mercedes S-Class, but geared towards those who loved driving. And on top of all that, BMWs oozed grace and elegance. I pined for a BMW of my own, and I knew that one day, I will own one. Fast forward two or three decades, and today's BMW is a shadow of its former self. Its sport sedans have been eclipsed, its sails are sliding fast, their huge grilled styling is meme material, and they don't have the guts to commit to EVs. It seems like BMW has lost its way, and if things continue, they might soon lose it all. And as for me, that pining is gone. Sure, BMWs are still nice, but I just don't want one anymore. In this video, I'll tell the amazing story of how BMW sealed its own fate in a single day. In this story, we'll talk about cars, but more about life. We'll discuss bangle butt and the shattering of norms. We'll see Steve Jobs, Ronald Wayne, and how Apple was formed. We'll discuss the innovator's dilemma, which turns leaders into laggards. We'll talk about Toyota. We'll see how second and third generation owners can ruin great companies. We'll show Elon Musk and Tesla and even Henry Ford. And most of all, we'll discuss bold leadership and lack thereof. If you haven't done that already, please smash the like button and subscribe to the channel. It really helps the channel if this happens early in the video. You can also support the channel on patreon.com slash connecting no dots for as little as one buck a month so I can keep creating content for you guys and send you my exclusive patron only newsletter. There's a link in the description. Now buckle up and get ready because we're about to see a leading incumbent getting hit by disruption and disruptions are never boring. Prologue. Present perfect future tense. We've just passed the intro, but I'm sure BMW fans are already hard at their keyboards writing angry comments for my even suggesting that their beloved company would go under. After all, last year's sales weren't that bad. They're still coming out with cool cars. And hey, everyone wants a BMW, right? Not everyone, of course. And the problem is that fewer and fewer do. BMW's performance in recent years wasn't bad, but the thing with predictions is that they don't give a hoot about the past. It's the future they're looking at. And the future is electric. The automotive industry is undergoing a massive change into EVs, and this change should arrive much faster than most people expect. Internal combustion engines' sales will fall off a cliff, and any company not making EVs will find itself in a world of pain. This is true for the entire industry, but more so for laggards, and BMW is one of the companies which are the furthest back in the field. For more details, watch my video, Ford, GM, and BMW will soon crash. After posting the video to my patrons, some pointed out that BMW just announced updated bullish EV plans. So I checked them out and we'll discuss them in chapter 4, but one thing you should know is I am now more bearish than ever. I am bearish on BMW, but if you think otherwise, be my guest. The future will unfold in time, but for now at least with only 9% electric vehicles, BMW is lagging. And the billion dollar question I will answer in the video is how is it that a strong market leader becomes a dead last laggard? The answer in a single sentence is that BMW became fearful of change, developed a follower mindset, and stopped innovating. With time, that's enough to do any company in. But how'd this happen? It's an epic story which starts with an epic car, the E65 7 Series. Chapter 1, the new 7 Series. 1A, Dad Butt, Chris Bangle's masterpiece. In 2001, BMW introduced a new flagship for the new millennium. The E65 7 Series, a luxury sedan which was designed by Adrian Van Huydonk under the direction of BMW's design chief, Chris Bangle. Two years before that, Bangle became BMW's first American head of design, a position which he held until 2009. The people, the process, the place, all comes together to make sure that we have the best product. 
you need really top professionals in a really top environment so that they see the cars, they perceive the cars, and they work the art into the cars like it should be, because this is art. This is the biggest sculpture that people every day come in contact with. During his tenure, BMW released some of its most iconic designs. Cars with flame surfaces such as the Z4 and original 1 series, sharp coupes such as the E63 6 series, and shape-shifting concepts like the BMW Gina. For the first time in its history, BMW passed Mercedes as the global leader in premium car sales. His achievements should be heralded and triumphed, but nobody remembers them because Bengal will forever be remembered for one thing, the Bengal butt. Bengal believed that to avoid getting stale, car design should follow a cycle of revolution followed by evolution, and then revolution again followed by yet another evolution. Since the E38 7 Series, which the new car replaced, had evolved from previous models and was getting long in tooth, Bengal believed that a revolution was called for. The E38 was a beautiful car with a classic three-box sedan shape, but a rather longest trunk. With new models always growing larger than the ones they replace, Bengal wanted to avoid the look of an extra-large box hanging in the back. Under his supervision, the Adrian Van Huydonk designed 2002 E65 7 Series had a larger-looking cabin and a stout trunk, capped by a clamshell-like sloping boot lid, a look that was quickly named the Bengal Butt. The new design had aerodynamic advantages and made the car seem spacious yet nimbler. To me, it looked like the future, but BMW purists thought otherwise and were simply enraged at the departure from the firm's previous design language. But the rear end has had style gurus from London to Milan spitting venom at BMW designers. More specifically, it's the tall, flat trunk lid with its rear line that doesn't seem to fit the fenders around it. BMW defends the design as not only more daring, but substantially more aerodynamic and space efficient. 1B, iDrive. But the controversy didn't end with the exterior, as the car's interior held another innovation which Bengal led, the iDrive controller. iDrive used a control knob mounted in the center console and an LCD screen to control most of the car's secondary functions and enabled Bengal to design a sleek interior with far fewer buttons, an idea which Elon Musk and Tesla would later pursue and take to the extreme. iDrive was clearly ahead of its time, but suffered from a first-generation interface and laggy hardware. BMW was treading unchartered territories, so automotive interfaces were at their very infancy, and iDrive's interface wasn't simple enough. Even small tasks, such as changing radio stations, required looking at the small screen and navigating through different menus, while driving a two-ton car at speed. Now add to this lots of lag between clicking an option and seeing it go through, and it was a recipe for disaster. Mastering all the high-tech conveniences can be a little daunting. All of the technology that's crammed into this vehicle, uh, I'm not sure people are ready for that. It's one of those things that, you know, people are used to a desktop computer. However, they're not used to a desktop computer in their car, which is essentially what the iDrive system is. It took me 10 minutes to figure out how to get out of the parking lot yesterday, uh, how to turn off the parking brake. The motoring press, fans, and regular buyers alike hated it. They called for removing the damn thing and going back to buttons like normal cars have. 1C, a fatal decision. With purists hating the exterior and everybody hating iDrive, the media and online forums overflowed with rage against the car, as well as against Bengal himself. There were several online petitions pressing BMW to fire Bengal. Time Magazine named BMW's flagship as one of the 50 worst cars of all time for its rear styling and lagging iDrive controller. And if that's not enough, 2002 and 2003 model year sales fell 60% from 2001. The last one just about killed whatever credit Bengals still had in the company, but in truth, he was set up to fail. Bengal wasn't just the first American to head BMW design, he was also the first non-European to do so, and only the second non-German. So although he won the job, BMW's conservative owners, management, and fans regarded this as a risky bet and closely scrutinized his actions, some of them eagerly awaiting for him to fail. So it didn't matter to anyone that sales of all luxury cars fell during these years. For example, Mercedes S-Class sales fell by 16%. And it didn't even matter that from 2004 onwards, sales started to surge and the E65 eventually ended its term as BMW's best-selling 7 Series of all time. The damage was done and Bango is permanently marked as too flamboyant, too risk-seeking, an American who doesn't understand the importance of tradition and how discerning European customers expect a BMW to be. Bangle said in an interview that whenever you move ahead, you leave some people behind. But BMW would have none of that. 
BMW's chairman at the time, announced something I couldn't believe I was hearing. He said that BMW customers dislike huge changes, that they expect their new BMW to be an improved version of what they're used to. And if that wasn't enough, he also added that from now on, BMW will make sure that's exactly what they get. The boss said, and the company started delivering. BMW's entire line changed considerably. iDrive took a step back and became more in line with competing systems. Flame surfaces disappeared, and the Bengal Butt, which arrived on the 7 Series, and by then already spread out to other models, such as the 6, 5, and 3 Series, was toned down. What's more, BMW became obsessed with focus groups and customer interviews, intent on designing their cars exactly like their customers want them. When I first read BMW's decision, I balked at it. It bugged me that they asked customers what they wanted instead of telling them. I mean, my God! You're the guys making the cars, possibly the best cars in the world. You're the ones whose engineers know technology when it's formed and can imagine the benefits it can bring. You're the guys who work at making the best cars ever, but you're letting your customers decide how your cars will be? Most customers don't have a clue about tech and barely put five minutes of thought into answering your questions, but you're letting these guys half-baked replies determine which cars you will make? And with the 7 Series, you're relying on the oldest ones to boot? Don't you trust yourself, and don't you trust your heritage to know what a good car is? I mean, what kind of leaders are you anyway? I loved Bengals' design, but it went far deeper than that. It seemed to me that putting the brakes on innovation was a sure way for BMW to stop being the cars I admired. They would start adding luxury and weight while losing their edge. I thought that back then, but didn't realize how deep this change will actually be. Two decades later, and with hindsight, I see that moment that BMW's chairman publicly backpedaled away from innovation as the day BMW sealed its own fate. Chapter 2. The customer is always right, right? 2A. Ask Steve Jobs. I said that I balked at BMW's decision, but to be honest, I didn't matter. I was a young car nut obsessed with technology, but the 7 Series was way out of my reach. I wasn't a potential customer, but others were. So shouldn't a company listen to its customers and ask them what they want? It should, but to a degree, because listening to your customers is very different from obeying them. For example, a company should know if its customers think the ride is too harsh, but deciding to what extent the ride should be made softer, if at all, should be made by company management and engineers, because only they can know the trade-offs that making the ride softer would have in handling and steering feel, and whether it fits the car's and brand's character. Knowing how to do this right is what separates winners from also-rans. I felt it was wrong, but I couldn't put my finger on why. Had this happened just a few years later, I'd be armed with this quote by Steve Jobs. Some people say, give the customers what they want, but that's not my approach. Our job is to figure out what they're going to want before they do. I think Henry Ford once said, if I'd asked customers what they wanted, they would have told me, a faster horse. People don't know what they want until you show it to them. That's why I never rely on market research. Our task is to read things that are not yet on the page. BMW's decision was against everything Steve Jobs believed in about product development, but that's only part of it. Much more significant was the chairman's announcement that BMW will not introduce additional revolutions and will only progress in small, measured steps. Doing this can be great for a while, but since other companies are not bound to the same vow, long-term it's a recipe for disaster. To be, or not to be, more important than it seems. When calling this video the day that BMW sealed its fate, I didn't mean that the chairman's announcement was a singular event. I'm sure things built up towards it, with meetings and decisions leading up to that announcement but I do see that decision as signifying a huge turning point in BMW's history. But did it really determine BMW's fate? I mean, even if they made that decision, what difference did it make? And even if we assume that it did make a difference, and we also assume that BMW will indeed go under due to its laggard status in electrification, how can I connect these dots when they're two decades apart, decades in which BMW's sales and profits considerably grew? Why is it that I am insisting that a decision made 20 years ago and helped BMW grow will now kill BMW? To answer the first question, the decision made a whole lot of difference. BMW started using customer focus groups as early as the 1970s, but following the E65's bad reception, customer involvement in product development surged. The company started determining itself as customer-centric. It took evolutionary steps and avoided any major revolutions. With MBAs proliferating, the same could be said for most auto companies, but it's like BMW caught an especially bad case of MBA-itis. So yes, BMW did follow that decision with consistent action. And as far as that second question, I fully agree that this decision helped BMW grow. Customers wanted luxury and comfort, 
They wanted SUVs. They wanted status. And BMW delivered. This somewhat diluted BMW's character, but it opened up much wider markets with lots of sales. So kudos to them. But sailing the calm seas doesn't prepare one for weathering storms. And this brings us to the innovator's dilemma. Imagine the year is 2006, and you're the CEO of a leading cell phone maker, and you're about to decide on your company's lineup for the next couple of years. Your engineers have some crazy ideas, but to be on the safe side, you consult with your customers. In 2006, you ask your customers what they want in a phone, and your next phone comes out with larger buttons. In 2008, you ask them about smartphones, and only a few use these. Most users are very happy with the buttons you gave them, and to keep most users happy, your next phone is a lighter, sleeker version of the previous one. In 2010, you ask them again, and by this time, some had left you, and the others want smartphones. You start working on it and launch your first-generation smartphone into a market dominated by third-generation Apple and Android phones. In his award-winning book, The Innovator's Dilemma, Harvard professor and businessman Clayton Christensen describes how new technologies cause great firms to fail. Note that he didn't say, even great firms, as in, everyone fails, even the great ones because it's especially leaders that fail once disruption hits. In other words, it's no chance that the laggards of laggards when it comes to EVs are Toyota and BMW. And it's no coincidence that an outsider, Tesla, introduced the disruption and that smaller Ford adapted to it before GM. Large incumbent companies lose market share by listening to their customers and providing what appears to be the highest value products. BMW and Toyota alike raked in tons of money by listening to their customers and giving them the ICE cars and SUVs that the customers wanted. Since EVs were expensive to make and had negative margins, they preferred to sell ICE cars instead and left EV niches wide open for new companies such as Tesla. With niches wide open, companies such as Tesla are able to take hold of the niche and relentlessly improve the technology until it's good enough to quickly take market share from the leader's main markets. When they start doing so, at first the incumbents don't realize it. Then, they do, but with too much to lose, they try to resist it, and by the time that they finally decide to join, they are too late for the game. And because leaders' practices have proven effective, leaders are especially late to change them. In my Agile at Tesla series, I made a video, link in the card above, showing how Toyota's leadership and production made it fall far behind. The same happened to BMW, but with them it was far deeper than just listening to customers. With them, it was fear. And this moves us to the next section, which is the Ronald Wayne Effect. We mentioned Steve Jobs, and everyone knows how he founded Apple with the other Steve. Less known, however, is Apple's third founder, the third guy, also known as Ronald Wayne. Wayne founded the company along with the two Steves when he worked as a chief draftsman and product development engineer at the video game maker Atari. With a steady job, a family, and home payments to tend, he had much more to lose than his much younger partners. Moreover, he'd been burnt before when a slot machine company that he founded had failed, which made him all too aware that success was far from certain. Long story short, he got cold feet, and 12 days after co-founding the company, he sold his 10% stake in the company to his two partners for $800, and a year later, he received an additional $1,500 to forfeit any potential future claims. When getting burnt turns people too risk-averse, I call this the Ronald Wayne effect, and it's exactly what BMW suffered from. Seeing sales fall off a cliff, getting protests and threats, and having their flagship voted one of the worst cars ever is definitely not what BMW had in mind when launching the 7 Series, and getting burnt like this, they vowed, never again. It's very clear how previous failures can make people risk-averse, but aren't these people, leaders of companies, supposed to be different? Failure is part of the game, everyone has it, and I don't see Elon or Henry Ford, Edison or Nikola Tesla letting failures determine their future. Forget these guys. Herbert Dees had failures but soldiered on, and the same goes for Jim Farley at Ford. What is it that separates those willing to tread unchartered territories from those clinging to the beaten path? Let's see how they got to their position. Elon, Henry Ford, Edison, and Nikola Tesla invented things and or founded their companies. Herbert Deese and Jim Farley moved from other companies. Toyota's ex-CEO Akio Toyota and BMW's owners Suzanne Clatton and Stefan Quant heirs to their title. Bingo! Chapter 3. The Heirs 3A. The Real Day That Sealed BMW's Fate I started the story thinking that the day BMW sealed its own fate was the day they decided to play it safe. But I was wrong. The real day that led BMW to its lagging position in EVs was long before that. It was in 1982 when BMW's owner, Herbert Quant, died and left the company to his wife and their two children. I must admit this puts me in a tight spot. 
I started this story knowing that I have to convince you that BMW is late to the EV party because they got hit 20 years ago and decided to play it safe. But if convincing you that there is a causal connection between the two dots was hard, now I need to convince you there's a connection between dots over 40 years apart. With this huge task before me, I did what any normal person would do. I called Elon Musk. Elon didn't answer, so I did the next best thing and asked ChatGPT. Here's what ChatGPT had to say. Under the ownership of Herbert Quant, BMW had a strong focus on engineering and innovation, with a particular emphasis on building sporty, performance-oriented vehicles. Quant was instrumental in expanding BMW's product lineup to include luxury sedans and SUVs while maintaining the brand's focus on sportiness and performance. SUVs, by the way, is wrong. BMW only started to make SUVs in 1999, long after Quant's death. But I double-checked and everything else is true. During this time, BMW's product development process was primarily driven by the company's own vision and philosophy, with less emphasis on customer feedback or market research. BMW was known for developing products that set new standards in their respective segments, and that were designed to appeal to driving enthusiasts, who valued performance and handling above all else. After Herbert Kwan's death, his heirs continued to own and manage BMW, and the company began to shift its focus from sportiness to luxury. BMW introduced several new models in the 1990s that were aimed at the luxury market, such as the BMW 7 Series and the BMW 8 Series. These models emphasized luxury and comfort over performance and handling, reflecting a shift in the brand's priorities. At the same time, BMW began to place a greater emphasis on customer feedback and market research in its product development process. The company began conducting customer focus groups and surveys to gather feedback on new products and features, and this feedback played a greater role in shaping BMW's product lineup. The differences between BMW under Herbert Quant and his heirs reflect a shift in the company's priorities and focus, from sportiness to luxury, and from a company-driven product development process to one that places a greater emphasis on customer feedback and market research. It is fair to say that ChatGPT confirmed my hunch. What happened at both BMW and Toyota is due to a phenomenon known as shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. This term describes a pattern where a family business achieves success in the first generation, loses momentum in the second generation, and often fails in the third, resulting in the family returning to a state of financial hardship or poverty. The traits of the second generation that contribute to this include entitlement. They feel entitled to leadership positions or ownership, regardless of their qualifications or experience. Lack of vision. Second generation members lack the vision and passion that motivated the company founder, leading to a lack of direction for the company. Complacency, where the second generation takes the company's success for granted and doesn't recognize the need to innovate or adapt to changing market conditions. Nepotism, where family relationships are prioritized over merit and underqualified family members are promoted into leadership roles. And finally, conflict, where power struggles between family members hurt the company's performance. Elon, Henry Ford, Edison, Steve Jobs, and BMW's previous owner, Herbert Quant, played hard. They were ballers who either founded their companies or saved them. They were driven and relentless and put their ass on the line. They all had their share of failures, but they all brushed them off and continued full speed ahead, eager to overcome whatever obstacles they met on their way to success. Second and third generation heirs, however, not so much. In 2000, Akio Toyota joined Toyota's board, and in 2009, he became CEO. It probably wouldn't shock you if I said this was due to his being a grandson of the company's founder rather than this being the person most qualified for the job. Like a shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves poster boy, Toyota showed lack of vision and shunned innovation. It seems as if Toyota focused on stopping EVs via legislation more than they did on producing their own EVs. They resisted EVs so fully that when forced to sell them, they commissioned a RAV4 EV from Tesla rather than develop themselves. And in 2016, Akio Toyota went full Ronald Wayne when under his leadership, Toyota sold for around $90 million its 3% stake in Tesla, a stake currently worth over $17 billion. Back to BMW. Herbert Quant was a second-generation industrialist himself, but having lived on the losing side of two world wars, his brain was far from fudge. He inherited 30% of BMW, which in 1959 was an alien company. But instead of selling it to Mercedes like the management wanted, he doubled down, increased his holdings to 50%, and financed the development of new cars which brought the company to profitability. Under his leadership, I repeat, leadership, BMW established a new segment in the car market, the Quality Production Saloon, and later the Sports Saloon. BMW's cars occupied a position between mass production cars and craftsman-built luxury cars, and their sophisticated technical skills helped them secure this niche and gain long-term competitiveness. 
When Herbert Quant died in 1982, his 47% stake in BMW went to his wife, Johanna, and their two children, 20-year-old Suzanne and 16-year-old Stefan. Born to riches, Suzanne and Stefan were cut of a different cloth than their father, and when he conquered risk to build his empire, they played it safe to preserve their own. 3D, petrified. BMW is afraid. It's petrified. Too afraid to make mass market EVs, they're late to the party and only sell them in small numbers. And too afraid to bet on the wrong technology, they cover all bases. Most BMW models are sold with gas, diesel, EV, and hybrid variants, no less. And for added safety, they also pedal hydrogen, afraid to leave it because, who knows, maybe it could win too. This not only spreads their engineering talent thin and wastes it on dead ends and wild goose chases, but it also prevents them from optimizing the platforms for any one power plant. Whatever configuration you choose, BMWs carry scar tissue, structures required to accommodate the other configurations. Bogged down with weight, the ultimate driving machine has become the ultimate compromise machine. Some wouldn't care, but for me, this is sad. And their classic, clean styling has become ridiculous. Under Herbert Quant, the grill remained discreet and relatively unchanged. But under his heirs, grill size started growing exponentially. Every product launch revealed a slightly bigger and sometimes more stylish grill, until in recent years, grill size exploded. I've heard this is due to Chinese customers liking large grills, and here again, we see how job one at BMW is to appease their customers. Recent grills are monstrous and garish, and their EV variants say this the best. The kidney grill started as the exposed radiator on early BMWs, and then became the air inlet for hidden radiators. But with EVs not needing such inlets, electric BMWs wear garish grills blocked by plastic panels. BMW completed a 180-degree turn from the no-nonsense, form-follows-function sports sedans that I loved to a garish form with no function on its current EVs. It's like they've completely lost their way. The only major company as late as BMW to the EV party is Toyota, and it too is spread thin on all fronts. Symbolically, the two companies recently collaborated in making a sports car, with Toyota's Supra heavily based on BMW's Z4. Fittingly then, BMW wants to make hydrogen fuel cell cars based on Toyota's Mirai. But Toyota changed course. When the Toyota family, holding a small percent of the shares, the company overcame tradition and ousted Akio Toyota. And while the new CEO talks about continuing his predecessor's heritage, it's clear that he's hell-bent on turning the company around. Toyota still has a fighting chance, but with Quants holding almost 43% of BMW shares, chances of the Bavarian company changing course are low. Contemplating on an ending for the video, I searched Google News for BMW EV. The first article, from 10 hours ago, states that BMW wants to develop a new combustion engine platform, as they plan on selling ICE cars for many more years. I can't. I just can't. They see the iceberg. The warning bells have gone off. The passengers are leaving in lifeboats. But the ship continues ahead to its doom. Because Bangle Butt. Because Ronald Wayne. Because second generation. And mostly, because no guts. As a YouTuber and just being a curious guy, I spend a lot of time browsing the internet and accessing online content from all over the world. That's why I want to talk to you about NordVPN, the VPN service that I personally use and trust. Before everything, I'll start with a myth. Since VPNs encrypt your internet connection, many people think that their main use is to ensure that scammers can't see passwords and personal info you fill online. This was true in the past, but nowadays almost all sites use encryption, so there's no need for a VPN for that. Why then do I use it? First, NordVPN ensures that no one, not even your ISP, can see what you're doing online. And to fully cover your anonymity, NordVPN has a strict no-tracking policy, so they can't track your online activities like some other services do. By the way, I highly distrust free VPN providers. I mean, if it's free, how do they pay for the servers? There have been some VPN services that were found to sell users' data. NordVPN cannot do that because their strict no-tracking policy is third-party verified. Another advantage of NordVPN is that it allows you to access content that's blocked in your region. With NordVPN, you can easily connect to a server in a different country, giving you access to content that would otherwise be unavailable to you. For example, Twitter Blue is currently unavailable in my country, but I applied for it using the VPN and it worked like a charm. I've been using NordVPN for quite some time now, and it's been a game changer for me. NordVPN are geared towards gamers, so the response rate is very fast. I'm no gamer, but unlike some other VPNs I tried, NordVPN does not slow my internet speed. I partnered up with NordVPN, so using my link below, you'll get a whopping 59% off the regular price, as well as 3 or 12 extra months. 
For me, they're my go-to service. So thanks for listening, and now back to the content. Chapter 4, BMW's Latest Plan, Bullish or Bull? After posting this video to my patrons, some pointed out that BMW has just announced bullishly updated EV plans. So I checked them out, and I cannot believe what I just read. I really do want to root for BMW. They're an amazing company, and I hope they succeed. But to me, their new plans that the media are all excited about say otherwise. Let's go through the main points in their plans, and the first is that they are more bullish on EVs and have shortened their timelines. To be honest, that was expected. Disruption is exponential and accelerates fast, but those being disrupted tend to think linearly. This means that they constantly underestimate future change and constantly have to update their plans to be more bullish on change. This is exactly why every few months we hear of another OEM being surprised with how fast EVs are growing and updating plans. You have to be living under a rock not to update your plans as EVs explode. So the real question isn't whether they're updating, it's whether the new update will keep up with the exponential, precede it, or continue to lag behind with linear thinking. Let's check BMW's numbers and see what they mean. There are two dates to check. The first is the tipping point where EVs reach 50% of new sales and start outselling ICE. And the second is the terminal point when almost all cars will be EVs. Let's start with the first one. And most headlines I saw said that while BMW previously expected the tipping point to occur in 2030, they're now expecting it sooner, around 2028. I expect 2028 to be the terminal point, not the tipping point. But this doesn't even matter because the entire argument is wrong. Careful reading of the news shows that BMW's statements that over 50% of 2028 sales will be EVs only apply to their M cars. In 2022, only 7% of BMWs came from the M division, so this really doesn't say much. We should look at total sales, and for the entire lineup, BMW chairman Oliver Zipse reiterated that 50% should happen by the end of the decade. With this momentum, more than half the vehicles we sell worldwide will be all electric before 20. 30. Despite the headlines, BMW isn't more bullish than before on the tipping point. So let's check for the terminal point, when ICE sales will just about stop. Here headlines said that BMW expects 90% of M-branded cars to be EVs by 2030. I must say it's smart to make M cars electric first, as they can get higher margins than their non-M siblings. Not to mention that this will prevent ICE M cars from being humiliated at stoplights by lowly EV SUVs from other brands. So good for them. But again, M cars are a small part of sales, so let's look wider. Other headlines said that BMW might move to sell only EVs before 2035, but that's wrong as well. BMW's chairman said that they are prepared to go all EV in some markets where that will be required. For example, Norway has just about stopped buying ICE, so I expect that to be one market where BMW will only sell EVs. But saying that you won't sell ICE where you aren't allowed to sell it if people don't want it, isn't what I'd call bullishness on EVs. So let's go wider. When does BMW expect to sell EVs only? Before giving the answer, I'll say what others think. Personally, I think that by 2028, almost all cars will be EVs, with just a few edge cases sold as ICE. So 2028 is the terminal point. And checking with JPR 007's Valley of Death graph shows that he too expects only 5% of new cars to be ICE. You could say that I, and even JPR 007, are both Tesla fanboys deluded by EVs, so forget us. Let's see what other automakers think. Mercedes plans to be 100% EVs by the end of the decade, and Audi plans to stop introducing new internal combustion vehicles from 2026. They will still sell older models, where that is still profitable, but are clearly putting all their eggs in the EV basket. And BMW? They don't just want to introduce new ICE cars, they're even planning to develop a new platform for them. And they plan to sell ICE cars wherever possible long after 2035, the year in which their sale will be banned in Europe, California, and many other countries. They still reiterate hydrogen as an option. And they are fighting to remove existing legislation so that internal combustion engines will be allowed long after 2035 if they use expensive and polluting biofuels. We believe that the mobility of the future also needs more than one leg to stand on in addition to battery electric drivetrains. We see hydrogen electric vehicles as a meaningful complement to e-mobility, even if with something of a time lag. Hydrogen has a lot of potential. Globally and across all industry, we are already on the way to becoming a hydrogen society. At BMW, we could even envision a production vehicle in the second half of this decade. 
Hydrogen could also be a possible drive technology for the Neue cluster going forward. Technologically, we are ready. We proved this a few weeks ago when we presented our BMW iX5 Hydrogen in Antwerp. I started this saying that a bullish update was expected, but my God, they aren't even slightly more bullish on EVs. They refuse to believe that people will stop buying ICE. For them, it's all government driven. They don't even get that the 2035 ban is useless because almost nobody will buy ICE cars by then, whether laws allow that or not. I started this bearish on BMW, but after seeing their plans, I have started to count down their remaining years. So long, BMW, you truly were great when you still dared to be engineers. Aftermath. The sad thing about it is that Bengal was right, but was too many years ahead of his time. The E65 became BMW's best-selling 7 Series ever. 20 years later, it still looks modern. iDrive arrived when the hardware was crude and laggy, but nowadays most luxury cars use something similar. And buttons are disappearing as well, most prominently in Teslas. And the Bengal butt? Even it was ahead of its time, as nowadays many new cars proudly wear it, as with this, the 2023 Toyota Camry and Renault Megan Grand Coupe. Even Mercedes has its version of the butt, but BMW does not. BMW keeps it staley with an old-style trunk. That's the safe, solid thing to do, you know. Farewell, BMW. It was a pleasure knowing you, and you were still yourself. And now, my friends, let me know what you think. Will BMW survive the change to EVs? Do you see a connection between heirs owning the company and its fear of change? And will Toyota make it now that they change CEO? Let me know below. I read all your comments. I will soon make a unique video on Tesla's Cybertruck, for a heads up when it's out, please like and subscribe and hit the bell icon. A super thank you for the super thanks to Pierre Cowett, Ole Peter Hemsred, Bill Obar, Richard Arnold, Jim Neely, Billy Revis, and Michael Mueller. And a huge shout out to my latest YouTube channel members, Bob A, Chris, JTB, Jurgen S, Thomas S, Scott M, and Stephen B. And to my latest patrons, Adam, Alexander TN, Alan B, Andrew L, Benjamin K, Choppa101, Dave W, David L, Eric R, Froman A, Gordon R, Hans N, IBM Cobol Fan, Jack and TN, James, Jan L, Jim R, Carl S, Koss, Larry H, Martin F V, Michael C, Michael K, Michael A M, Neb C, Oliver T, Paul W, Pez J, Philip E H, Reginald J, Roland T, Ronald P, Scott G, Scott M, Stan and Carla H, Steve K, Stephen J B, Todd M, Victor R, Vince, and Wood H. And all my patrons, you guys rock.